Welcome everybody. Uh, it's great to see so many people here today. My name is Elaine Farndale. I'm um, the Centre Director for the Centre for International Human Resource Studies at Penn State University, and this is the IHRM webinar series. Um, the series is a collaboration between uh, us here at Penn State, uh, together with uh, Simon Fraser University, the Center for Global Workforce Strategy, uh, that's Mila Lazarova uh, in Canada. Uh, we also have um, Mar Marian Festing and Maral Maratbakova at ESCP Business School in Europe, um, Maya Vidovic from RIT Croatia, and Miguel Olivas from Penn West in the US as well. Uh, so basically what happened uh, three years ago now, so in 2020, we decided that we needed to do something, given all our conferences were being cancelled, and we wanted to be able to still hear our keynotes speaking everywhere. So that, that was where the whole webinar series came from. And today we have number 23 in that series. Uh, it continues to be highly successful. There are thousands of views of the re recordings of these webinars. Um, so it's yeah, having a great influence on the international HRM field. And basically, we will have a presentation for about 45 minutes um, and then time for questions at the end of that. So what is today's presentation? Uh, today, we are talking about informal network research in international HRM. And our guest today is Sven Horak. Uh, Sven teaches and researches in the field of international management, human resource management and leadership ethics at the Peter J. Tobin College of Business at St. John's University in New York. His research examines the important role informality plays in managing globally. And more specifically, he explores informal structures and the drivers and ideals of informal networking. His work helps global managers to connect and to improve their networking capabilities in a responsible way. Further, it enhances the theoretical and practical understanding of how informality and informal networking affects and influences the practice of managing abroad. So Sven worked for several years in the East Asian automotive industry, managing operations for the Robert Bosch Group in Tokyo, Seoul and Stuttgart before joining Tobin. He was a postdoctoral fellow and research associate funded by the German Research Foundation at the Institute of East Asian Studies and the Mercator School of Management in Duisburg Essen University in Germany. He was awarded his PhD in Institutional Economics from Duisburg Essen University for his research on the influence of culture on managerial decision making behavior. He has held numerous research and teaching related visiting positions at institutions such as the University of Tokyo, Assumption University in Bangkok, Seoul National University, Korea University and Yonsei University, Penn State University and others. <laughs> it's quite a list. And he is a visiting professor at Yonsei University in Seoul, an alum of the new leader program of the Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Affairs and a member of the American Council on Germany. So on that note, I would like to hand over to Professor Horak to give today's talk. Sven? Yeah, all right. Uh, thank you so much, Elaine, for this nice introduction. Um, big thank you also um, to uh, all organizers, to the whole group, to all the universities who make this wonderful webinar uh, series possible. I've been myself a big fan of this webinar series. Now I had the opportunity to uh, present my research as well, and I'm really grateful for this, right? Also, thank you, everyone who is joining this seminar now. I hope um, that I can present something um, novel to you, something that you maybe don't um, know yet um, so, so well. This presentation is about my major field of research, about informal network research, and I connect this to international management, right? <clears throat> um, I can imagine that um, this field is something new to some of you, right? Because let's be honest, um, do we really have already a kind of research area that is called informal network research? Or is this now rather social capital research or social network research, right? So I'm using the term informal networks 
just recently, right? And I'm not really aware um, that um, there's so much other research out there that tries to take a look <clears throat> on informal network research from a bird's perspective, right? Um, so, and this is pretty much what this presentation is to a great extent about, right? It's to a great extent um, 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 conceptually driven, right? I really like to um, um, explain a little bit in more detail what I understand under the research domain of informal network research, right? And of course, I will connect this to um, the field of international HRM questions that are actually important because, for example, as expatriates, right, we need to understand how networks operate because we need to network when we are abroad. We need to establish relationships. We need to integrate into networks either um, in the business sphere, uh, right, in order to be successful um, abroad in our mission um, for a company as an expatriate, right, or also in our private life, uh, right, which is also important, right, you know, likely the research um, about how important it is um, that um, an expatriate um, feels well in a foreign environment, right, so informal network uh, net networking is important in, in, both, in both domains, right. <clears throat> Let's um, go slowly into the subject um, and um, reflect reflect a little bit about networking, right? Yes, we will talk about informal networks. We will talk about networking. And um, this is, and I think this is what I also really like a lot about this kind of subject. Everybody of us can really identify with this, right? So either whether you are an informal network, a social network researcher or not, likely you have something to say about networking because likely you do this yourself quite often. <clears throat> um, you will actually see a little bit later that especially the international dimension is something I think that's really, really important, especially for the domain of international, uh, international HRM. Networking. <clears throat> what do you think about when you reflect about networking, right? Do you enjoy networking, uh, right? And some of you likely think about network events, right? We all know this, right? We have, uh, we go somewhere, there's a formal part of the agenda, and then we have networking time, right? Get ready to mingle. You know, the ex extroverted of you strive likely, right? The introverted at that moment when it comes to mingling and networking, run to the toilet at night for 15 minutes, right? So <laughs> some of us enjoy networking a lot, others not really so much, uh, right? Um, interestingly, for the ones who don't really enjoy that so much, right? Don't worry, there's a search out there by uh, Castiaro uh, et al., right? Who found out that networking can even make people feel dirty. Hmm, uh, this is interesting, I think, right? Networking and feeling dirty, why is that? So <laughs> um, what you find in this paper is that networking has often an instrumental component, uh, uh, right? And, um, you know, what does it mean, instrumental networking? I have a kind of hidden agenda, uh, right? What does networking, why am I in this kind of situation on networking events, right? What does that mean? Laughing at bad jokes, right? And pretending to enjoy the event. Some people think in these terms about networking, right? And um, <clears throat> yeah, this kind of um, um, situation where people actually network in order to achieve something, this is this causes people often make uh, make them feel dirty, right? And interesting, this re research also says that that uh, makes them feel dirty and that subconsciously makes them crave for cleansing product. A very interesting paper published a while ago in, in the ASQ. I can recommend that, right? When it comes to networking, <clears throat> we often think about networking, or let's say the general thinking about networking is that this is, of course, a necessary um, thing to do. We must network in order to be successful in our lives, in order to get ahead, um, right, in order to access resources, uh, right? There's no doubt at all that networking is a very important activity, right? That is also the reason why there, is, there are so many seminars out there, um, uh, uh, right? Um, about networking, right? LinkedIn, for example, offers a lot of web-based training about how to network like a pro or something like, <laughs> like this, right? Yes, this is all relevant for, um, for this talk here too, right? Because it reflects actually um, 
um, basic ideas about networking, basic thoughts about networking. So when we think about networking, we often think about networking in a very similar um, um, direction, right? It's a positive activity. We have to do this. We need to be good at it, uh, uh, right? And, and so on in order to get ahead in life, in order to get jobs, access resources, and, and so on, uh, right? I'm going to introduce you today about informal networking, what I call informal networking in an international context. And here we have a little bit different ideas, a little bit a different perspective about the nature of the values, the ideals of networking. This is important to understand because imagine as an expatriate, you go abroad and you don't know how networking works abroad. Later about this a little, a little bit more. Just as an introduction, just to get into the groove, right? I have um, a clip for you um, about networking success, right? So that should be a little bit, a little bit entertaining. Don't really take it now too seriously, uh, right? Um, it is a clip um, that lasts for just 20 seconds. And you see very soon Prince Harry, um, someone we know very well, trying to get a job for his wife, Megan. Um, uh, right. So what you see here on the on the screen um, is already the scenario, right? Just a couple of years ago, right? Prince Harry is here talking to Bob Iger, and Bob Iger is the um, again the CEO of Disney, uh, right? And Harry is using this kind of maybe it's a networking event. It looks like a networking event, but Harry looks this kind um, uses this kind of uh, situation to get a job for his wife. He is asking Bob Iger for a favor, uh, right? Um, I'm going to tell you um, a little bit more what you will see now very soon. This clip is quite fast. Uh, there's a lot of background noise, uh, uh, right? So um, likely you will not really realize what it, what it is about, right? Um, but it's about a job for his wife, Megan, right? And this is a um, job for a voiceover, uh, right? For a Disney movie. Um, this is actually the moment where Harry was successful getting that job for his wife, uh, right? <clears throat> um, so she finally got that job, right? Um, let's just quickly take a look at, at that clip, right? So give me a moment. Um, recommendation, read the text below the video clip, the caption, uh, right? So likely you will not really hear what's um, going on there talking wise, right? Because it's so loud, right? But there's a caption, right? Take a look at this. Again, Prince Harry <clears throat> approaching Bob Eager, quite out of the blue, using the moment, sizing the moment, right? Getting a job for his wife. Here it is. Yes. Right. So that was this clip, right? So he was actually approaching Bob Eager. Um, you know, she can do this voiceover. She has experience with this, uh, right? And then Bob Eager was saying, oh, that is so interesting. We love to try this. So now we know because that movie, don't ask me exactly what the title is, that movie is out. So he was basically successful. <clears throat> is this a networking situation? Yes, I believe so, uh, 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 right? <clears throat> it is an example um, it, it, well, it takes a look at a small part of networking. What is networking is a broad, really broad subject, right? But he is using the moment on an event, right? Approaching someone um, he maybe doesn't really know before, right? And asking for a favor. Favor, favor exchange. This is a very integral part of, of networking, uh, uh, right? <clears throat> um, what is also interesting is um, now, what is the secret of success? How did it turn out to be successful? We have to ask ourselves, um, right? Or we have to see what is basically invisible for us, uh, right? Um, he is a part of a group, basically, right? So he has, in principle, access to resources, uh, right? Harry is a kind of celebrity, and people are somehow amused, they sympathize, likely, of 
being now in this kind of situation, right? When you take a look at what is um, what is what was around them, right? People were in a really uh, good mood, right? The wife of Bob Eager smiling, right? Oh wow, it's 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 Prince Harry. So Harry has access to resources that likely others of us do not really have to get the job. If I would run around there and say, hey Bob, you know, um, how about a <laughs> voiceover? I can I you can imagine, right? Many of us don't really have access to these resources to these network resources and um, one fact that defines informal networks is that informal networks can be seen as a biographical byproduct that we often don't really proactively need to develop it's just there somehow uh, uh, right <clears throat> because of the status that we have we have access to certain certain resources right um, so I just wanted to use this example to kick off my talk here, right? And this is what we are going to talk about um, um, now, right? Um, we will spend a lot of time on conceptualization. What are informal networks? I believe it's rather novel, right? You have heard before about social capital research, social network research, right? Informal networks, that is as a category, as a distinct category of, um, uh, of research, rather something developing, I would say, right? But I believe it makes sense to make it distinguished, um, uh, distinct, right? And why this is the case, we'll get back to that soon. We will take a look at some examples of informal networks, right? We will talk about some key characteristics, right? I have actually, meanwhile, through uh, many, many years of field research, um, um, trying to explore informal networks, right? And I will share some of these insights from expatriates from the field, right? And I also um, will give an outlook about what are the important, what are the existing research domains of informal network research, right? And what could be um, interesting future avenues to pursue, right? And I hope that I can really um, present now all these kind of things um, in uh, the next the next thirty minutes round roundabout, right? Let's start with conceptualization, right? And talk about constructs and and features, right? Again, back to the introduction, right? What is what is the conventional thinking about networking, right? So <clears throat> if we generalize, I think networking is in generally seen as a positive activity, right? We should do this. It leads us, um, um, it gives us uh, benefits somehow, right? It makes our careers progress. We believe that in principle, everybody can engage in networking, <clears throat> right? If we are a little bit extroverted, right, you know, getting out there, talking to people, right, this will do the job somehow, uh, uh, right? Yes, introverts can also network. They do it a little bit differently, right? But extroversion is um, regarded as very positive, right? <clears throat> Going out there, talking to people, approaching people, right? Establishing relationship means when we have something to offer, uh, right? Uh, we are basically welcome into networks somehow, uh, right? Because the idea is that networking is in principle rather an instrumental kind of thing, uh, right? <clears throat> when we talk about networking, as in from a Western point of view, we are not talking about making friends. It's more about partnership, right? It's about um, 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 bringing something in that may be valuable for the other, uh, right? We expect also reciprocity. So um, <clears throat> networking one-on-one, -on -one, some of the typical features that likely everybody would agree on what networking is basically about. When we take a look at these networking uh, seminars, at these networking trainings that we see on LinkedIn, right? The interesting thing is that the trainers often claim universality. We often, and I think this is also reflected in the social capital literature in the original, in the early one, right? <clears throat> that, uh, you know, this claim of universality, how we actually network, how we accumulate social capital somehow, right? <clears throat> and how this translates into social networking then, <clears throat> that seems to be a universal activity. I don't believe that, uh, right? And um, to me, it's rather clear that, you know, I have this cross-cultural management background, uh, right? I have always been interested in um, exploring cultural similarities and differences, right? And, and you know, um, improving um, um, things um, in, in business, uh, uh, right? That uh, maybe could cause cross-cultural conflict or so, right? But people with um, a cross-cultural background have per se the understanding that values and norms differ across cultures. 
<clears throat> and when networking is an activity that follows certain values and norms, <clears throat> there must be just differences across cultures, how we network. And this has tremendous implications for business expatriates and basically for all kinds of net, uh, uh, all kinds of expatriates, right? <clears throat> Self-initiated expatriates, right? This also has implications for for immigrants, right? Also an interesting kind of kind of question. Where's the difference between an expat and an immigrant, right? Hmm. Um, once we are in an environment that is not the one where we're socialized in, right? We are all sitting in the same boat, and whether we are a self-initiated expatriate or a business expatriate, <clears throat> we face similar challenges, right? And this means getting connected to local networks. So that there are cultural differences when it comes to networking is basically straightforward. And um, here you see a really nice illustration that's very popular, that's made by um, a graphic designer, right? Um, from China, who actually lived in Germany for a longer time. And he illustrated his experiences into pictograms, right? And this one here is about networking in the East and in the West. We can generalize this as East and West. It's actually about Germany and China, uh, right? But um, I think it illustrates very well um, um, where the differences are in networking behavior, right? Likely you have seen that before. Represented the blue, blue field representative for, for the West, right? You have actually um, separated groups. People are somehow connected to each other, but there are not really so many connections across the group, uh, right? What would you guess? How does networking look in, in China? And um, believe me, this is similar in Korea too, right? And other East Asian countries too. Tada, totally interconnected, uh, uh, right? So you have actually virtually everyone is connected to everyone here somehow, right? This gives us somehow an idea that there must be differences in networking behavior in the East and in the West, uh, right? Using this, this example. When I talk about informal networks, I talk about Wasta, for example, in the Arab Middle East, right? Talk about blood in Swazi, talk about uh, in, in Russia and the post-Soviet Union, uh, right? Zifarish uh, in Pakistan, Yongo and Inmak, very important constructs in South Korea uh, that define social relationships that um, define networking behavior, right? In Myoko and in Japan, not so much written about this. Interesting, right? That in, in, in Brazil, Guangxi, Kopsat in France, Guangxi in China, and, and so on, right? The list is actually long. And the interesting thing is, I find this really fascinating that every country has this kind of um, certain expressions for networking. In Germany, for example, um, just in case there are some Germans here, right? We call this vitamin B, vitamin B, and B stands for connection then in, in Germany, um, uh, right? So every country has networking concepts and constructs, right? And here you find just, um, uh, just a small selection, right? You find a, there's a very nice source, very valuable source out there, the Encyclopedia of Informality, right? So um, um, now it's available in two volumes. A third volume is on the way. It's edited by Alena Ledeneva, a name informal network researchers know very well about her work um, of blood uh, in, in Russia, um, right? And um, yeah, the best thing is uh, that um, the Encyclopedia is available free of charge on um, the website of the publisher, right? So this encyclopedia is about, you know, all types of informality, right? Informal ties, networks, informal practices. And this also should point us now when it comes to conceptualization, let's put this puzzle together and try to find out now where's the connection between now informal networks, uh, informal institutions that also plays a role, right? And social practices, uh, right? How does this get, get together? Um, more about this um, very soon. So um, as I mentioned, informal network research, is this a domain um, that is it can be called a distinct domain of research? Maybe not, not yet, right? Because many scholars do not really use the term informal networks, right? Um, I had actually the pleasure to, pleasure to work with um, three wonderful uh, scholars who are all working on, on this field, right? Dana Minbaeva, uh, Alena Ledeneva, and, and Mara Muratbekova, too, on, right? And we got just recently this paper out in um, the um, Academy of Management Review, where we actually talk about the relationship between informal networks and um, um, informal institutions, uh, right? And in this um, 
um, paper. You will find, by the way, a link in the chat box. Kara is going to post this, I, I think, um, um, so that you can um, access that, uh, that paper. We provide a definition of informal networks, uh, right? There's a definition of social networks, of course, available, of social capital. Informal networks, I think that's rather something novel, uh, right? And our definition, now in contrast also to the definition of social networks, right, goes like this. Informal networks can be defined as channels embedded in the respective culture that provides the general behavioral norms and ideals of interpersonal exchange. What is important here is that informal networks, by definition, very closely connected to culture. Culture plays a role, right? Behavioral norms plays a role, um, uh, uh, right? Ideals um, uh, play a role. What is the output? What is the result of this, right? Network members have the privilege of access to favors, but also care, goodwill, commitment, and so on, um, uh, right? Um, right, people who have these, info, who are members of an informal network, right? They actually have access to certain opportunities that others who are not members of the network uh, have not, uh, right? So what I think is important that we have that focus here on culture, uh, uh, right? More about this very, very soon. Informal network research, uh, what, what would be the status? Um, first of all, I think um, it's actually a pity that we not yet do have a comprehensive study available, an integrative review article or so, that somehow unites informal network research that takes a look at all these networks and try to generalize about it, right? Um, that is actually missing so far in the field of HIM and IB or international management too, right? And I think in other disciplines, you would also not really find um, an overview article that reviews um, uh, the constructs and comes up with, um, you know, um, some general, some um, uh, specific features of an informal network research, right? You find out there research that focuses on separate constructs. There's a lot of research on single constructs, right? There are a few studies um, that compare uh, informal networks. Um, there are studies that compare um, blood and um, in Russia and Guangxi in China, um, uh, right? There are studies that compare um, other two constructs, right? Yongho in Korea and Guangxi, right? <clears throat> yeah, there are quite a lot of differences, right? <clears throat> there are also studies out there that, um, a rather recent study by uh, Sang et al, right, that compares three constructs. And comparative research is very important to really understand now the distinct features of the respective networks, uh, right? It's not really so easy to come up with um, generalized statements that would be valid for all networks, uh, right? So comparative research helps us to understand res res uh, respective constructs um, and better. We also have to say when we take a look at um, um, studies that are out there that most studies are rather conceptual. You don't really find too many empirical studies. There are some empirical studies out there, but there are much more studies that are very descriptive, um, right? <clears throat> we have to confess that there are some exceptions. Guangxi is the exception number one, right? There is Guangxi research conducted since decades, right? Since 20, 30 years. Um, all kinds of research, conceptual, quantitative research, qualitative research, right? Um, Guangxi is actually quite um, an established and a big field. However, uh, right, it's just Guangxi. And we saw before that every country has this kind of informal networks, right? What we cannot do, I believe, there are people who have a different opinion, but what we cannot do is that we generalize that what we know about Guangxi is also relevant for other networks, right? Not really. So my approach would be, first of all, before we generalize and come up with a general theory, we need to understand the characteristics of <clears throat> all the networks that we have, basically, uh, right? So there's also in... Um, um, in um, other domains, uh, research on blood available on Russia, uh, right? Political sciences, other social sciences, right? Increasingly, we see uh, research on WASTA in the Arab world, right? Um, <clears throat> a lot of descriptive research, but recently also more and more um, 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 quantitative research. <clears throat> um, it is in general quite scattered, that landscape, uh, uh, right? Unfortunately, again, we are as scholars do not really work in one direction 
where we now finally would actually say, <clears throat> I apply a similar methodology, I use a similar conceptual frame, and so I contribute to theory development for informal networks. This is actually not really yet the case. The story on social network research looks actually really, really different in contrast, uh, right? So I think we should actually, as scholars who are interested in informal networks, somehow try find ways that we can establish something like uh, replications, um, uh, right, in order to accumulate uh, knowledge and finally then um, uh, theorize um, in a more, more solid way, uh, right? Um, yeah. Let's go further, uh, right? This here is my view uh, on informal networks that I really want to share with you, right? So first of all, uh, when you take a look at the right side, on the left side here, you see the so far conventional view, I would actually say, right? So networks are usually described as connections between people. This is a very popular definition of social networks, <laughs> right? Connections between people. You have actually nodes and you have connections between them. That's basically it, right? <clears throat> we have um, these theories of bridging networks, uh, right? Uh, there is uh, the so-called Tertius Gaudens, the third who benefits, the third who can maybe connect um, 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 networks, right? And who benefits by this information flow that goes through that person, uh, right? These are very conventional, very traditional um, um, theories in the field of social networks, uh, right? <clears throat> um, how they operate, mostly based on Western ideas, right? Yeah, I'm very general here. And if I really have diehard net social network researcher here, you would likely oppose this a little bit and say, oh, well, 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 some other notions, but let me just generalize to, um, at this moment to make the contrast to what I'm actually talking about a little bit more um, clearer, uh, right? So um, how social networks operate based on Western ideas, right? Like they are open, right? Everybody can, uh, can somehow become a member of a network, uh, right? And contribute, right? There is this instrumentality, right? It's clear that, um, yeah, we want something, uh, 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 right? <clears throat> From that network, uh, right? And it's also good to be more extroverted, uh, right? So. All of these things can be really criticized from an informal network point of view. And my preferred um, way of illustration is what you see here on the right side, this kind of Pollock-like painting, right? I think this pretty much reflects the nature of informal networks. There are different intensities, right? There are groups that are bigger than other groups, right? Some groups spread really across uh, the entire picture some, somehow, right? Everyone is somehow interconnected, but in different ways, right? There is multiplexity, uh, right? People do have different networks um, and are differently connected to networks, uh, uh, right? What is the center of informal network research are informal institutions, right? Culture plays a role again, right? We are interested in why are people connected and how can we learn and understand how to possibly get into networks, right? Because when the international contexts come into play, we need to study these con constructs, um, uh, right? <clears throat> we find out very soon that there are very different type of ties. There are sometimes, some ties are voluntary, uh, right? They are pretty much, you know, similar in nature as social network ties. Some are blood-based ties, um, right? Some are also effective ties, uh, uh, right? Or as my colleague Peter Ping Lee just recently described it, we can distinguish um, socially ascribed ties, uh, right? And um, ties that are achieved, achieved versus ascribed, right? We'll get back to that a little bit later. This is very important. It relates to networks where you are quasi born into and where outsiders quasi cannot get access to networks. And this stands in very sharp contrast to what we know about social networks, uh, right? <clears throat> Whereas social network research often talks about, yeah, diversity is great, establish diverse ties and, and so on, right? There are some informal networks where you just cannot get access, doesn't work, right? Think about the implications for business expatriates, right? More about this um, 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 soon. I think this is very important. I find this very fascinating. <clears throat> Let's go deeper into conceptualization. 
at the core, we have informal networks, right? And this is this tends to be a structure, but informal networks must be seen in relation always and in connection with informal institutions because informal networks are embedded into informal institutions. Both are embedded into culture. We need to distinguish when we talk about informal network research, in my opinion, uh, these levels. Um, currently in the literature is often bundled, it's often confused somehow, right? Um, many scholars talk about informal institutions when they talk about Guangxi. I would say, well, Guangxi is a network, right? Informal institutions is a part of that network, <clears throat> but we have to really distinguish these uh, three levels. And the cultural embeddedness is also important, especially, I again believe, for <clears throat> international um, uh, managers for expatriates, right? It's really important. As a result, we have social practices, uh, right? That are also important, uh, right? Like favor exchange. That is the social practice of um, informal networks, favoritism, loyalty, obedience, uh, right? And, and so on. <clears throat> um, this connection, we have actually analyzed, we have theorized uh, about it um, um, in this AMR paper that I was just mentioning, a little bit more, more, more deeper, uh, right? And this is something really, really interesting. So the role that informal institutions play um, in connection to informal networks, this is really something very special, uh, right? Um, yeah, again, a lot of papers tag what I call informal networks, like Wasta, Guangxi, Yongbo, and so on, um, often it's text, it's an informal institution. You find a lot of, uh, in the IB literature, literature, a lot of papers that say actually Guangxi is, is an informal institution. It's not really, <laughs> it's not wrong, uh, right? But I think it's more precise if we distinguish these three levels, uh, 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 right? What is out there, in, especially in the IB lit uh, literature, is um, this discussion that um, maybe informal yeah, institutions, if you want to call it that way, like Guangxi or, or Wasta or Blood or so, um, maybe they recede over time. There is this persistence hypothesis out there, uh, right? The persistence hypothesis in IB is about that um, informal networks will, in principle, um, um, persist because they are culturally driven. However, the um, general ideas in the IB literature is basically, well, informal networks, they depend on institutional development. The more institutions, uh, the more countries develop economically, the more um, formal institutions develop towards effectiveness, means that courts are more reliable, that law is more enforceable abroad, and so on. People will not really rely on networks, uh, right, on, or on these informal institutions anymore, right? Um, I believe that's wrong. So there are different camps of scholars. I'm the one who says actually they are culturally driven, they will persist, right? And this is the way how we argue in this paper, in this AMR paper, right? Informal networks, informal institutions, they depend on each other and they will persist because they are something cultural, right? And culture, as we know, is something quite rigid and changes slowly. Right? We are not really saying that culture doesn't change, right? Thanks God, it changes, uh, right? But it goes very slowly and networks adjust, so they will persist, um, <clears throat> right? <clears throat> so if this camp of um, IB scholars is right, that um, informal networks and these institutions will disappear over time, the more um, formal institutions work develop towards effectiveness, informal network scholars have a problem because their research field just disappears, right? That would actually mean, well, I care about them. They will actually disappear sooner or later anyway, right? So um, we, don't, we don't think so, right? Um, now, the question is, when we would accept that um, informal networks and institutions persist, uh, 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 right? Why is this the case? Why do they persist, right? And this is now the role where informal networks really come into play, because we actually say in that paper that informal networks channel these dynamics, continuity and change in informal institutions, uh, uh, right? They are interconnected. Informal networks enact informal institutions. We have to regard both as connected, uh, right? So when we talk about one, we cannot forget the other, uh, right? In this paper, we also classify different types of informal networks. We classify them in um, networks that can be described as rather effective and very close that you can really not penetrate as a foreigner. And other networks are rather open and are used more instrumentally, right? We believe that all these networks persist, 
basically, uh, right? But we believe actually that um, those networks that are very close and that um, are more effective, uh, uh, right? <clears throat> um, they persist actually much, much longer than networks that are rather open, uh, right? They actually change their kind of uh, shape faster. Nevertheless, we believe they don't really disappear. So this is a very interesting um, uh, paper, I think, and we are, we're really we're very happy that we could accommodate it um, in, uh, in the uh, AMR, right? This is actually, now let's disentangle uh, these research domains actually a little bit, right? I know it's a little bit uh, a bold claim that I come up with here, right? But I'm actually working towards establishing informal network research as a distinct field because I believe it's uh, different compared to social networks and social capital, right? At the same time, I believe there's also an overlap and these fields are interconnected, right? I'm not saying hmm, that social network research and informal network research are totally isolated from each other. Not at all. They intersect at some parts. But still, I believe that what I read, what I know about informal networks, does not always is so not it's not always so much in tune with the, what what the social network and social capital literature is about. And let's think about who came up, who developed social capital, right? Social capital, and then you know, based on that, we have social network theories, there, right? I mean, it's pretty much developed to a great extent in Western countries, uh, uh, right? Has there, <clears throat> oh, you know, think about uh, Pierre Baudin, uh, right, from France, of course, right? Love, love is research, uh, 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 right? Um, uh, Putnam, basically, political science, bowling alone, social capital, uh, right? And, and, and so on, uh, right? So it's quite Western, Western driven, I, I, I think, uh, right? We see the notion, I mean, are they same? Are they different? That's an ongoing question, of course, right? It's my opinion that they are uh, a little bit different, right? I believe that informal institutions, they are more closer to informal networks. And informal institutions, you don't really see so much debated in the social network kind of or capital uh, literature, right? I believe, you know, a very, very broad and superficial reflection on social network research, right? Often we believe they are open, they are accessible. They are used uh, for a purpose. They are purpose-driven, instrumentally used, right? Weak ties play a role, um, uh, right? Um, loyalty and these things, obedience between members, that is not really something so important in the typical um, past um, literature on social networks and social capital, right? It's not really about friendship. It's more about partnership, uh, uh, right? However, informal networks, there you have, they are more effective, they are emotional, right? Often it is it's about friendship, uh, right? Friendship first, then we do business uh, some, somehow, right? People would actually say abroad, I don't do business. If we are not friends, right, forget it. We don't do business some, somehow. If we network, we network based on establishing a deeper relationship, uh, uh, right? They are more personalized, right? Loyalty plays a role, right? The ideal of weak ties, for example, well, in many countries, weak ties bring you not very far. They, weak ties don't get you the jobs. It's strong ties. Some networks are per se strong type networks, uh, right? <clears throat> um, um, right. And often, not always, but often they can be quite close that it's hard to penetrate them, um, uh, right? Here we have an example where um, um, we deconstruct WASTA. WASTA in the Arab Middle East, right, is the dominant kind of um, networking uh, type, right? Um, my, my dear co-author Fadi Aslan wrote uh, in a paper that WASTA is um, the way of life in the Arab world. This tells us that we have here, that we, we deal with something that um, integrates, the, that, that spans over the private sphere, the business sphere, right? It's not really about the thinking that we discussed before, oh, let's do a business networking kind of thing, right? So WASTA is something very pervasive um, 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 in the Arab world, right? And um, we try to now apply this concept of informal, um, of social capital somehow in some way, right? Of informal institutions and social practices. And we define WASTA that we call it here, um, informal uh, network autonomy, uh, right? In terms of its organizational structure, um, and here we lean rather towards the traditional social capital literature, right? It, um, 
consists of two different type of ties to describe it. You know, they are voluntarily concluded ties, but they are also predefined ties. They are blood ties, and means you are quasi born into Wasta networks, uh, right? <clears throat> um, defined by type of tie, family membership, right? Um, um, close, very close friends um, would also count as so-called pseudo family members somehow, right? Because um, uh, family ideals play 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 a role, right? Also, um, you have Wasta with people from the same clan, same tribe, right? Same reason, same sect, and and so on, right? These are all um, um, structural bases of of Wasta, uh, right? <clears throat> um, there are also voluntary concluded um, uh, concluded ties, right? Likely. Um, now leaning more towards the social capital literature, likely uh, they are more weaker in terms of ties than these blood-based ties, uh, basically, right? But you would have Wasta then uh, with mutual friends, acquaintances, right? But also a co-worker or so, uh, right? Important is that this has to be seen in order to understand it, uh, right? In order to understand the anatomy of, of Wasta, I am using here medical terms, right? We have to really take a look at um, what is the glue? What keeps them somehow together? These are informal institutions like that are very typical for that region. Trust, respect, commitment, loyalty, right? Obligation and, and so on. Reputation, um, uh, preserving one's honor, right? The Chinese version of pro preserving one's honor would be keeping face, uh, for example. These are very important informal institutions that play a role. As a result of both, you have social practices, right? And social practices that are born out of network structure plus informal institutions is favor exchange, uh, right? Is favoring family members, for example, uh, right? Often on cost of competence, right? When it comes to hiring, Wasta networks can do magic, uh, right? Magic also in terms of putting people into positions where they are maybe not really the most competent ones, uh, right? But the ones with better Wasta, with stronger networks uh, somehow, right? Um, just a note um, um, to draw this line to um, expatriate management and so on, right? Now, if WASTA is business in, uh, is important in business and private life, and if WASTA consists to a great extent of predefined ties based on family membership, clan, tribe, sect, and so on, right? <clears throat> Think about how you get access to these important networks as a business expatriate in an Arab world, right? <clears throat> These questions are extremely important, I think, and it's a very important, important context from my from my point of view. I could not resist also to show some infographics that I um, um, created um, um, uh, based on the book that is just published, right? An edited volume on informal network research and international business. I don't really want to go into detail. Um, um, yeah, let's get connected on LinkedIn, for example, right? I have posted them uh, there. They are shared by, by many people. Maybe they came across, um, um, you came across um, uh, of, of some of them um, um, in, in the past, uh, right? So we try to, of course, explain something very complex in um, yeah, quickly so that people can actually grasp what they are about in two seconds, right? Informal networks are complex. They are culturally embedded, right? They are multiplex, they develop dynamically, and they are important. Another characteristic that we need to take a look at. Morally ambivalent. I'm just taking a look at the time now, and I'm very shocked that I basically run out of time. Oh my God. <clears throat> Um, right, I think I need to really uh, skip um, many, many slides here, um, uh, right? So um, what are the key characteristics, uh, right? Let me actually um, uh, go a little bit quick uh, uh, further. We have here informal ties in, in South Korea. Yonggo is a kind of tie that is very, very um, uh, difficult to uh, basically penetrate, right? Because it consists of ties that are education-based, family-based, and regional origin-based, right? As you see, many ties are actually given by birth, uh, uh, right? Blood ties, um, uh, especially, right? And family ties, right? There are other networks that are more um, uh, penetratable, more, more general, right? In MAC, for, for example, right? But given that I ran out of time, let me just go 
here we have another pictogram, uh, right? And these infographics, basically, um, you find also um, the link towards them in the chat box, right? So you can download them, maybe use them for educational purposes. They are, of course, free, free to share, right? So um, the key question is, how can expatriates penetrate um, informal networks, given that some of these networks are actually not penetratable, uh, basically not developmentable? Um, right, this is the key question. And here I have actually, um, uh, well, unfortunately, we ran a little bit out of time now. Um, a lot of comments here, uh, anecdotal evidence from the field, uh, uh, right? Um, in the field of recruitment, promotion, diversity and inclusion, and in general, right? And as a summary, we see that network access, this is where many expatriates actually struggle with, right? Case Yongo networks in Korea. Except with actually say, yes, you can develop deep and trustful relationship, right? But you cannot establish your goal. This is really, really tough, right? Information transfer. Information is transferred through networks. And for companies, this is hard to control. That's very difficult, right? In terms of behavioral ethics, also an important uh, research domain. <clears throat> um, loyalty is higher towards the network than to a corporate code of conduct. What implications does this really have for corporate citizenship, for example, right? These are actually problems that are connected challenges, let's call it challenges, to informal, uh, to coping with informal networks, right? <clears throat> um, that are um, uh, important uh, for expatriates basically to solve um, abroad, uh, right? <clears throat> um, here I do have um, some ideas about what would be um, um, an interesting path for future research uh, based on a paper I read with uh, Yong Sung Pak um, that was just recently published in the International Journal of HRM, uh, uh, right? Um, hmm, I would like to really have some time, five minutes to discuss this, right? But you see, <laughs> in a nutshell, across several domains, several levels, individual level, group level, corporate level, um, uh, we can easily connect and we should actually connect and explore research deeper, right? If it's, um, um, well, expatriate effectiveness, for example, adjustment and, um, and performance, very important. And how far do informal networks represent a barrier, right? Especially when expatriates cannot really uh, connect um, to um, important networks abroad, right? That you find over here in that, in that overview, uh, right? How to solve this? All right, I need to I need to round it up, <clears throat> uh, right? I think it's important <clears throat> to understand certain network constructs better. Not so much Guangxi in China, this we know very well, but there are other countries out there, and I would especially encourage scholars from respective countries explore this kind of networks that you have. That can maybe I think make a really big contribution. So since networks have really some um, good sides and also some bad sides, uh, right? <clears throat> um, we would need to understand the ethical implications of networking abroad better. Often when we as an expatriate network abroad, we don't know the consequences where it takes us. <clears throat> In case we don't know <clears throat> the norms and the rules of networking, uh, right? So we can get into Hell's Kitchen if we try to network abroad, but don't know what we do. Hmm. Coping in general is something extremely important, right? What does that mean? What does the existence of informal network mean in terms of hiring, promotions, uh, 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 right? Networks can be quite strong. Networks can actually make things happen. As a business expert, I need to understand these structures and patterns uh, to control them, uh, right? We need to face reality. Some networks we cannot penetrate, uh, 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 right? What are the alternatives, right? How to turn a liability into a of foreigners, and this you see into this spectrogram. Again, no time to discuss this now in detail. You find, um, again, all these spectrograms on my website to download, right? Um, use them free for educational purposes. And also take a look into that book, right? All about informal networks, right? You learn a lot about Inmac, Yongo, Jatinyu, Wasta, and so on, right? With um, 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 a very nice group of, of authors. Thank you so much for your kind attention. And yeah, happy to answer one of the other questions if there's still time. Right? Thank you very much, Sven. That, that's excellent. Um, we're going to squeeze one question in because I know people do need to, to rush off. So uh, a very practical question on the end of this. Uh, there, there's so many. I have 
I would demonstrate here my scribbles or my questions that I have here. Um, but basically, um, this is a question from Justin Winkler. What are some major advantages of social networking and what are some tips to improve your overall networking skills? Yeah, of course. Well, people network, of course, in order to access resources, in order to get jobs, in order to get information uh, quite often, right? And um, yeah, you, we know that there's a variety of information, right? Um, informal networks are often used to get information um, through competitors, um, of, of competitors through their networks, uh, right? So there's often also information that is really difficult to get. Networks can enable that, uh, uh, right? Um, um, that is the business perspective, right? In private life, you know, I have talked to people who had really interesting expat positions, right? And they said, well, work was okay. After work, there was not much to do. I could not really make any friends, uh, right? You need informal networks. You need social networks for well-being, right? In order to be happy abroad, uh, uh, right? You need you need these ties in business and in private. How to improve networking? Well, especially when it comes to informal networking, try to observe what is going on around you. How do informal networks abroad operate, right? They operate in different cultures very differently, and this we need to understand, right? Thank you, Justin, for that question. That was a very, very quick answer. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> there's some other comments. I'm basically thanking you for the presentation. Um, I, it was very insightful and I, I learned a lot. And I, I really wish we had two hours for you to be able to continue through all the detail and everything there. But um, good recommendations to follow up with reading the AMR um, article, uh, looking at the encyclopedia um, that you suggested. Um, all of these pieces and those infographics, they're, they're very quick and easy ways of grasping some of that information before then reading on to, to really understand the detail. Um, so on behalf of everybody here today, uh, thank you very much, Sven, for, for the uh, very interesting um, conversation today. Um, for everyone, just so you know, we have our next webinar coming up on April the 27th. And that will be Rebecca Picari talking about, let's talk about language. So have a language perspective on international HRM and international business research. Uh, there are also, um, if you look in the chat now, you'll be able to see where you can sign up for that event. Um, and just time for a couple of very quick announcements. Um, we have special issue calls open in the International Journal for Human Resource Management and Journal of World Business related to international HR topics. Uh, these will appear in the chat in, um, shortly. And also a, a hot off the press note for anyone hoping to attend the uh, Human Resource Division International Conference, the HRIC in South Africa um, at the end of, of um, end of May, that one. Uh, just a, a hot off the press, the early bird registration is being extended to the 30th of March. Um, and that's taking place in some city in South Africa. If you are interested in attending there, it should be a great event. So thank you very much, everybody. Our time is up um, and we hope to see you again in April. So thank you and goodbye. Thank you. All right.